Welcome. If you are uh, in North America, like me and Mary, good morning to you. If you are elsewhere in the world, I'm seeing particularly in, uh, in East and Southeast Asia, a good evening to you. We're delighted that you're here this morning and also um, looking forward to, uh, as has been mentioned, to this uh, important topic. I'll just give a few overview things and then we will turn it over to our first presenter. We're going to hear two presentations this morning and the way it will work is that one will present uh, and uh, Ezra Kim, our first presenter, will have 20 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A for her specific presentation, uh, question and answer that is, and then uh, we then we will move to uh, Eliana Ar Arunku and she will have another 20 minutes for her presentation and another 10 minutes for her specific uh, question and answer period. And then we'll move into a time of question and answer for both in which hopefully we can connect some themes from each one. Just a few guidelines today. Uh, participants are expected to have read papers before this meeting, but if you did not read the paper that's being presented, uh, then please allow those who have done so to start the discussion. You can obviously ask questions about the presentations themselves, um, but let's let's uh, prioritize those who, who can, can speak to both uh, paper and presentation. We also invite you to be fully present during the presentations, extending and presuming welcome please listen actively with a spirit of curiosity. As we move into each discussion time, please, not to, not, please try not to deviate too far from the session uh, and the paper topics. Let's try to keep things more or less on topic. Uh, finally, we're likely all familiar with Zoom and online etiquette. Uh, you'll see a number of functions along the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're not presenting, please mute yourself during the presentations, during question and answer periods. We can have, um, can have uh, spoken questions as well as in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, you're welcome to make session notes and to ask questions, as I mentioned, using the chat feature. Um, and during the discussion time, please keep yourself muted unless you're asking a question. You can ask questions again in the chat. You can use the reactions to raise your hand, or you can simply unmute yourself and uh, and mention that you have a question. I will uh, introduce our first speaker now. Ezra Kim did her doctorate at, at Knox College at the University of Toronto in Canada. She's a practical theologian and educator focusing on youth agency, betwixt and between identity, theological youth ministry, counter-narrative pedagogy, and decolonial theory. Ezra also serves a congregation there in South Korea, if I'm not mistaken, uh, as an associate pastor for international relations. She works with global partners to deepen an intercult intercultural ecumenical dialogue that goes beyond short-term mission work. Ezra, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'll share my screen. Okay. Um, so if you can hear me well, and if you can see my screen well, please give me a thumbs up, anyone. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's Ezra, as um, Peter introduced. Thank you for the introduction once again. And it is really exciting um, to share uh, my research with you all. So uh, last year when REA announced um, their theme for 2023, whose children are they? Many supposed parents came to my mind and I started to wonder how migrant youth, immigrant youth would answer this question. And migrant youth here, I talk about Korean Canadians, um, but I hope this research can give some insights to youth whose identity is hyphenated hyphenated, not only Korean Canadians, but like other this and this hyphenated identities, um, or those who identify themselves as third culture kids. And I became curious about how youth ministry and church community impact them in answering this question, whose children are they, if I have to answer, ask this question to the youth. Um, so I will unpack this question with the keyword belongingness. 
Um, and when I say belonging, I do not refer to owning material objects, but to having a sense of affinity to other people or, or places. So first I um, briefly look into the multiple belongings the youth experience in their school community to paint just a broader picture of Korean Canadian youth social location. Um, Cause as they are living in a country that aims to be multicultural or um, so-called mosaic country, youth tend to experience more belongingness than in the States. Um, but um, I still expose how youth are not still fully belonging, uh, experiences belonging here and um, how they how that makes them become the children of between. And then second, part, I investigate their Korean Canadian church community, a community which looks like on a surface level that they fully belong to, um, a community which is what they chose instead of going to a predominantly white church or a multicultural church. Um, here, their experience in these churches is not only about being fully in included, but it's also very multi-layered and that um, is another factor that makes them the children of between. And then in the third part, I explore how they navigate the betweenness, this betwixtness um, that they're positioned. And I argue, despite these challenges, youth creates their own ways from, from this between. And I actually say, uh, I take a step further and say this, this in-betweenness that they are in is where they are from. And that's where um, they create a new agency. So let's go into the first part. It's about multiculturalism and Korean Canadian youth. Um, so as many of you already know, Canada blankets itself with multiculturalism, which has its, um, its good parts, it has its pros, but this paradigm often becomes the very vehicle of racialization and grants people some sort of immunity from not talking about racial marginalization and racism. And, um, Imani Benaric, she exposes multiculturalism and she actually says that it establishes Anglo-Canadian culture as the ethnic core culture while tolerating and hierarchically arranging others around it as multicultural. Okay. And this is exactly happening and shown in schools that youth attend and youth attend. So Toronto um, District School Board this data is a bit out, outdated, but this is the most recent data that I could find. Um, they did a census in 2018. And when you see this graph, you can actually see that 50% of the students identify themselves as being Asian descent. And 29% of students identify themselves as being white. So the majority is non-white um, students who identify themselves as non-white. Yet, uh, if you look into the curriculum, it a lot of teachers, when they did the interview, when the um, Asian hate um, racism issue arose with COVID and everything, a lot of teachers said that curriculums lacks of cultural varieties, such as courses weren't created, literatures like books they read in classes, they it didn't um, represent all the diversity and there have not been many resources available to inform teachers regarding racism and microaggressions. Uh, and just information about other cultures. So a lot of um, these youth, they uh, belong to the school, they belong to the community there, they make friends, um, but then there is the sense that somewhat they don't fully belong to the Canadian culture, Canadian society. Uh, so these youth, not all of them, but many of them, um, find refuge in their Korean Canadian church. And another key component of Korean Canadian youth religious formation is that they can belong to their ethnic church without being asked where they are really actually from. And unlike the, the early immigrants who were mostly poor and could not speak English, nowadays um, immigrants, especially youth, the second generation, they tend to be highly educated, they have sufficient funds and are relatively fluent in English. But the interesting thing is, um, Asian North American churches and in Canada too, they are still growing and they are still playing a vital role in not only the first generation of immigrants, but also the latter generations. And this phenomenon just baffled many scholars. And then they asked question like, why do people 
still choose and establish Asian North American churches in North America rather than attending one of the existing predominantly white American churches. Um, so the answer to this is first, church becomes a place where belonging occurs in the form of solidarity. So as immigrants face similar hardships, they navigate the glories and challenges of immigrant lives together. And it might be plausible to think that the second generation is free from all the challenges, uh, challenging immigration experiences as they are more involved in Canadian society and are fluent in, in language, um, they still bond over their uniquely challenging experiences as the second generation and foster solidarity with one another. So here is um, a, a, a quote from Anne, a second generation Korean Canadian. She says, um, for the second generation, because we go through so many of the similar things together, we can help each other out. Like because there's this generation gap and different cultures growing up, our values are a bit different from our parents. So sometimes that conflict, it's really hard at home, but we have youth groups on Friday and we would come together, talk about it. And it's really relatable because we all have similar things going on, like little problems with our families because of different values growing up. And it's nice to be able to come and be able to talk to the kids and feel connected and find a solution together. So the church is one of the keepers of their own culture, but it is not merely about maintenance of cultural tradition, but also it's about connecting its members to their roots. So churches provide Korean language programs for second generations, um, Korean that celebrate Korean traditional holidays and emphasize Korean Confucian values more strictly than those who are residing in Korea. And even though Korean Canadians live in the West and the youth receive um, progressive education in school, the congregation proves to be more reflective of a conservative and evangelical affiliation due to the, the value of education that take place at home and in churches. And second gen and latter, latter generations upbringing takes place in this Korean household. And they are naturally exposed to Korean elements that influences their mixed identities. So this incorporation of culture and religious resources creates a unique setting as a Korean Canadian church and that faith becomes integral to the immigrants um, and not only their religious identity, but for their um, social, uh, socio-cultural identities. So even the latter generations, even they speak fluent English and relatively unfamiliar with the Korean language, they still choose a Korean Canadian church as their home um, due to the rootedness and culture of belonging. And um, youth, another, um, youth named Ruth, she says, I was born and raised in Canada. I have love for Korean heritage, but it's definitely tied into church because that's the only place where I get my cultural influence from, really. So for ethnic minorities, faith provides a framework for addressing life issues as well as assisting to preserve, negotiate, and um, perp perpetuate their distinctive ethnic identities and cultural traditions in the wider society. So the role of Korean Canadian church play in the immigrant lives is not only nurturing their faith, but it's impacting their lives in a um, holistic way by helping them maintain transnational ties with their ancestral lands and understand, um, helps youth understand their minority identity. The church plays a very vital, um, important role to them. But then the thing is, what's interesting is um, as youth are not Canadian enough in schools, they are also not Korean enough in churches. Um, unfortunately, even in their ethnic churches, youth experience some unbelongingness. Um, Namsoon Song, she is a research, she, she has done a research on Asian Canadian and she, Canadian youth, and she shows that no matter how old the English speaking ministry members are, they are considered equivalent to children and subordinate to the first generation Korean speaking congregation, which means they're always treated as house guests of the church and never become the hosts. 
And unlike some North American mainline churches that um, appoint youth as elders, many Korean Canadian churches mostly do not include youth in the wider congregation. So especially even after confirmation, uh, which is a ceremony that um, acknowledges that youth can make their own faith decisions, um, youth are still not being um, seen much in the wider congregation, um, but silenced in the church. So Rebecca Kim, um, Associate Professor of Sociology at Pepperdine University, she, she says that more than 80% second generation Korean Americans are estimated to leave their parents' ethnic church. And one complaint that the second generation Korean Americans have against the first generation is that the immigrant church seems more like an ethnic institution than an authentically religious institution. And it is, while it is true that ethnic religious organizations provide shelter, their parents, Korean cultural heritage is the main component of the community. So many Korean Canadian youth, they tend to um, be doubly marginalized from the mainstream society and also from their own immigrant communities because of their um, hybrid identities and because of their social location. So like I said before, to the first generation, they are um, never Korean enough. So, and moreover, youth also live in this um, theologically and religiously plural world. Outside of their ethnic church building, they live in a multi-faith Canadian society that, that recognizes various religions um, yet most of the Korean ethnic churches are against religious plurality, and even theologically um, and among Christian communities, while the biggest Protestant denomination is the United Church of Canada, which declares its inclusiv inclusivity to every human being and emphasizes its focus on social justice movements, uh, many Korean ethnic churches um, are more affiliated with the Presbyterian Church of Canada and tend to be more conservative, um, geared toward more evangel evangelizing people instead of um, having big interest in social justice issues. So in this, this also creates another um, crack for the youth and makes them belong to the between um, and, in the, and leave them in the betwixt. So in this betwixt and between, how does their agency look like? Like, where does their agency come from? Can there still be agents? Like, what does their religious agency look like? And because second and subsequent generations, youth come from the between and they belong there, this can be viewed as a negative factor where they are not neither this or neither that. But I argue that this betweenness this creates something new. Um, and Homi Baba, he writes about how agents both revere and menace authority. In other words, like authority, it says oppressive center. So youth um, revere, but also yearns for what is their own, not what is, what is their upper generation. Like Rebecca Kim said, um, they drop out of church because it just became the first generation's culture and first generation's institution instead of um, having something that's their own. So they yearn for something different. They still revere what the first generation has, but they are um, looking for something that's more genuine to themselves. And here, in churches, first generations can be and cannot be the oppressors, yet the dynamic between um, the first and subsequent generations occur, occur in a similar way. Like I said, um, youth also mimic, mimic the center, but they also push back and exercise their agency. So youth, their situation is, they are inherently in conflict and they mimic Korean traditional culture, normative adulthood, but then they also refuse and challenge this tra tradition. So um, youth becomes more aware of this ambivalence for their situation and their hybridity um, as they become more true 
uh, aware of their hybridity and their identity, they become true to themselves and they become okay with belonging in this between. They become more okay with being in this betwixt and between. So use internalizing their status um, leads them to project that neglect onto others, but a youth agent with interstitial integrity, I argue that um, they know that it is dehumanizing to build one's agency on neglect of the other. So they enter deeply into the oppressive system, um, but they also um, act and transform the system. And um, youth agency can be confrontational, but it also acknowledges the center's fear because they know what it is like to be in this between. And an interviewee from um, Song's research, her research captures this new generation sentiment. And she says, now we are the second generation. You can't expect us to have that same thing because we grew up in a different culture, in a different world, in a different time. So third culture kids, I often, my, I myself as a third culture kid, I often heard this question, where are you from? How do you identify yourself? And the answer is more complicated than just giving the name of a country, like I'm Korean Canadian, I'm German Korean, I'm Korean American with a hyphen. But understanding the hyphenated identity experience is related to understanding one's more multi-layered social and religious um, location. So to going back to the question, whose children are youth? I would say they are the children of between. Korean Canadian youth belong in the messy middle ground and come from there. They are expanding the boundaries of the between as their home. So youth are the children of the inherited past, past the multi-layered present, and the alternative future. So while doing this research, some questions came up. Um, how does the structure of your church community impact youth religious formation? Um, another question that came up is, in what ways do you think youth agency looks different from that of, an, of a migrant youth agency, like the youth agency from your context? Those are the questions that came up and thank you for listening to my presentation. If you could hear uh, Zoom talking to you uh, like it was to me, I apologize for that. We were trying to figure that out uh, how, right before the session began. Thank you very much, Ezer. If you have questions, or if you, the rest of the audience, that is, have, have questions for Ezer regarding her presentation, I invite you to um, put them into the chat or here in just a moment to, uh, to raise your hands. Um, I'll have a question that I'll ask in just a moment to help get us started. Um, uh, you know, as one of the things uh, that you said toward, toward the end about being, uh, having, having difficulty answering the question of, of where you're from, I myself grew up as a third culture kid and I identify as such growing up in both the Philippines as well as the U.S. And when people ask me where I'm from, I like to think of it as not just being a piece of biographical data, but I have to tell them a story in order to actually tell them where I am from. In your paper, you... Uh, you mentioned something, and you um, and you also echoed it in your in your presentation. Um, and I'll go ahead and put this question into the chat as well. Um, if in between youth are, as you put it, uh, to exercise their agency by being intensely alert and refusing to accept easily what is regarded as common sense, um, and if they are to exercise agency in some of the other ways that you talked about. Uh, in your in your presentation, what might this look like in cultures that prioritize obedience to parents? And I'm thinking not only um, from what I understand of Korean culture, but also Filipino culture and others. Uh, yeah, this is this is an amazing question. Um, 
So I would like to say that first prioritizing obedience to parents is not equal to neglecting youth agency, right? Um, when I observe many uh, conversations between youth and their parents, what happens is, is that um, the parents talk, some, talk about something, youth push back and the adults uh, gets uncomfortable and frustrated. And then they pull out this card and says, I'm your parent, like you need to listen to me, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but I guess acknowledging that youth having agency does not actually correlate to um, just blindly obeying to their parents' rule. And um, so I guess like we have to understand that first and make that um, distinction first there. And then um, I want to take this uh, a step beyond just the culture that prioritizes obedience to parents is many, yes, many Asian cultures, I think, view youth sharing their thoughts or just um, saying what's on their minds is considered as talking back to them and it's not obeying their parents. But if we uh, turn our eyes a bit, not only those cultures um, neglect youth idea, but other cultures label youth like acting out and whenever they are trying to show their agency, um, they label it, it, it as like, oh, this is youth risk behavior. Like you're, you're acting out. And I'm not saying that risk behaviors do not exist, but I'm saying that adults or the society tends to label whatever youth are doing. Like if it's somewhat different to the norm, um, it frightened if something what youth are doing frightens them, they try to label it as risk behavior and try to dismiss them, just youth being youth. Um, yeah, so that's that's where my thoughts thoughts are going. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Again, it is, uh, if this is a group that is to the margin anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can use that as, uh, as another card to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, a comment and a question. I um, first of all, I really appreciate uh, as there's research on the identity formation and the spiritual uh, formation of migrant youth um, because I'm the mother of two second generation Korean Canadian children. <laughs> and uh, especially adolescent children. <laughs> um, I was thinking that um, uh, as there uh, refers to uh, their identity uh, as in between being, I was thinking that they, uh, their identity can be also called uh, as beyond being uh, mm -hmm. rather than in, in between being. I know that um, uh, you base your um, uh, research on the uh, Homi Baba's uh, post-colonial um, theory because they can create their own identity, their agents, which is neither Korean nor Canadian, but also uh, it's also uh, both Korean and Canadian, but it's not just like a smoothie mixture um, because their identity, they can create their um, identity uh, with resistance to Korean and Canadian, but they also accept Korean and Canadian and their identity are very, very different and unique their ident unique identity um, per all, for all individuals. And uh, the, that was my thought. Yeah, thank you for that. It, um, that's, that's definitely a really good point that it's not just being in between, it's just being liminal in the liminal space, but it's more um, goes more to hybridity um, and something beyond that. So that is a really good point. Um, I just want in, in my presentation, I just wanted to um, show that how their position that they are in that 
messy middle ground. Um, I just wanted to highlight that in my presentation. And it is definitely important that, that they take it to um, not just staying in that liminality, but going to that hybrid, hybrid identity. Thank you. Other questions for Ezra this morning or this and this evening? Yes, uh, could I ask a question? Uh, Remedius, is that you? Yes. Uh, um, yes, uh, Remedius and then Chuck. Let me see if I can turn on my uh, video. I don't know if you can see me. Um, yeah, the, the question I have is, um, thank you, the presenter. This is very um, interesting study you did. Um, I, I see the challenge of your work. Uh, I have, I, I, I used to take care of a Ibo Nigerian community in Connecticut, and uh, I see almost uh, what I would describe as this unhealthy dynamic between the uh, first generation and second generation um, immigrants. And I've come to the conclusion that by the, the time we get a third generation immigrant uh, community, there's almost a total disconnect except except uh, when people are asked the question, where are you from? They tend to decouple from um, the first generation, second generation, and tend to uh, assert an alternative identity, uh, which is neither here nor there. And I notice also the difficulty, the perennial uh, lack of home <laughs> in 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 that in that dynamic. And so I was wondering if the researcher could uh, define uh, or flesh up for me: is identity always a social construct, or is there something else to it? Is is it is it a is 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 a identity socially constructed and in that sense it is always evolving and we can't even wrap our hands around it such that when a first generation uh, is a certain authority because uh, he or she believes there is a certain cultural deposit he has to hand over to the next generation. Uh, and meanwhile, the dynamic, the, ex the existential dynamic is almost a, a rejection of such treasure. And so help me, what is your sense? Is identity always a social construct or is it something more? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. So is identity always a social construct? Um, I do think social construction definitely plays into it. Um, I can't really think of, because um, what else would there be if, when I was listening to your question, I'm curious, like what other things do you have in mind if it's, um, if it's not socially constructed? I, I don't have, and I, I haven't thought through this because the, mm -hmm. what I, I, I think that uh, the process of socialization is um, the job of a community. 
and this community has, if you like, its stories, its fables, its ideas of who a human being is. Yeah. And that, with that as a deposit, is able to socialize the next generation into accepting those uh, values, or if you like, the philosophy. Yeah. Now, when individuals are exposed to another culture, another, another society, those fundamentals seem threatened at best. And then something amorphous begins to evolve. And the parents who are raised with those fundamentals, uh, they panic, basically, because what they have received is threatened. Or it seems uh, they have a responsibility to hand this over and hand this on. And when it is a situation of rejection of what this, the rejection of this treasure that we want to present, then you have a problem right there. And I'm wondering whether in our religious education pedagogies, it is a possibility of situating the individual in a primary culture, in a primary culture of the parents to make this socialization an easier process so that this generation there is an education that is going on at home that situates the individual in the primary culture of the parents and secure in that uh, culture the individual can launch out and relate to if you like the hybrid community uh, it seems to me that will be much more seamless than the chaos I noticed in this dynamic. I do not have any answer. So my, my maybe it's a conservative view. I, I think um, uh, effort should be made to bring up a child in a primary culture. Um, if he or she is able to internalize the fundamentals of that culture, the philosophy, the customs, for instance, somebody said something about uh, parental respect in my own culture, that is big. You, you cannot really socialize even as an individual when that is rejected. I, I, cannot, I cannot see that uh, being safe for the individual. Well, that's as much as I can go because I haven't I haven't really researched on this. Now, one more thing I may say. I I saw the what alarmed me into paying attention to this was the uh, suicide rate among among youths, uh, the blacks in 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 Canada. I just did a simple action research of looking at newspaper reports, which is you will, you will think is always underreported. I interfaced that with what was happening in Chicago, the much I could re reach out, what was happening in New England, and interfaced that with what was going on in Nigeria. And the graph was almost similar in this population of um, next generation. So, and the, the questions, the, the, the individual, the, the notes that were left were always the difficulty of uh, surviving in this betwixt and between kind of culture. And that's very, very alarming. I'm sure by now, if there is a, a, a recent study, that, that will be uh, much more frightening than what I saw in, in, in about 10 years ago. So, so let, let me leave you with, with other, if other people to contribute, if, if I may. Thank you for and taking my question. And I know that that Chuck at least has a, yeah. a question. Others of you uh, may, and I see that that Norma had a question in the chat. We will reserve those, uh, if you would, for the combined uh, question and answer period uh, after uh, Eliana's presentation, and then after her question and answer period. Thank you to all of you who uh, engaged uh, as are here. Uh, I invite you to continue to do so and to keep the things that she said in mind as we move to Eliana's paper.
Uh, Eliana uh, Arukun uh, is, uh, let me get to my, um, my notes here, apologize. I had, I had uh, pasted one in uh, and then hadn't, hadn't had the chance to do the other one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Eliana Arunku is uh, assistant professor in homiletics at the Graduate School of Practical Theology in South Korea. She is also assistant pastor at Supsam uh, Church in South Korea. Uh, she is on the educational advisory committee at uh, uh, Dacian that uh, connects communities and builds the next generation, as well as a researcher at uh, the Women's Network community in the Korean church that makes a safe space for women to connect and build relationships. Her research interests include lament, hospitality, post-colonial feminist hermeneutics, epistemic justice, and narrative ethics. Eliana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Oh. Thank you for your patience. Um, my study explores how Christian education can access and embrace children, where refugee and internally displaced people, IDP backgrounds, to address the issue associated with uh, feelings of losses safely and to contribute to socially just framework. This study intends to find ways to alleviate the suffering of children due to violence, oppression, and control and pursues a community of mutual respect that honors children's identity and subjective experiences. Um, Maurizellos reports that more than half of refugees are under the age, age of 18, and all of them have experienced um, atrocities related to their refugee status. Sarah Dresden Peterson says that the number of refugees worldwide is at its highest level since World War II. An ongoing conflict have left refugee groups struggling for decades to stay together and maintain a chance at survival. The ways in which communities have dealt with forcibly displaced people have varied widely. Um, widely. Heartbreaking is that not all refugees are afforded the same degree of empathy and consideration despite drowning children and, and barbed wire fences, overcrowded camps, deprived, um, deprived rights and killings. Um, so here is the question, why, some, why have some people received lament and why are others disqualified from being lamented? Scholars, including um, P.D. and Kasmi et al., suggest that if current trends um, continue, future refugee and forced migration studies will increasingly move to cities rather than isolated refugee camps. By 2012, more than half of refugees were living in urban areas rather than camps. The UNHCR, UNESCO, and other organizations, as well as people working in the field of refugee education, have done a great deal of work on, a, on behalf of refugee children and have made a positive difference. Um, nevertheless, there are gaps in the socially just response basic, including negotiations with policymakers, limited policy implementation for practical gains between countries, and the presence of countries and regions that are not aligned with the international policy, making it more difficult to create a pathway toward an equitable access to education for children and all refugee experiences. So um, Judith Butler criticized those who are not accepting the trial and the trials of lives destroyed and the people killed as something for which we need to be responsible. 
and for not recognizing our own roles in this corrupt history. Both of us says we need to create and maintain the effective structure to engage in righteous causes, not to excuse this situation. Emily Townsend also says that what we do every day shapes us and it's where both the hegemonic imagination and the challenges and hopes to dismantle it are found. So this everydayness includes listening carefully when people speak or do not speak, talking to people and taking whatever they said, as meaningful and being present in people's lives, sharing meals, face, facing heartbreak and disappointment and getting up and trying one more time um, to make life right. It is in this everydayness that we the people are formed. In this regard, this um, research argues that regardless of our, um, regardless of children's diverse um, circumstances or are our children and the local community can and may reach out to them all. So the position of Christian education clearly has limitation in answering or evaluating original policy questions or modeling various theo um, theo theoretical or academic approaches. Nevertheless, I believe the Christian education and communities can play an important role in bridging the space and rigidity between the ideal, um, idealized and actual laws and part actual laws and partnership of globalized actors such as UNHCR and national governments, including the ways in which they negotiate the old uh, age old tensions between national sovereignty and global responsibility by complementing and supporting the creation of laws and systems that allow public education to practice in more flexible ways. Um, so um, United um, UNHCR was a global agency initially mandated to educate um, refugees. However, as refugee education remained outside the scope of the national education system, the responsibility was um, temporarily transferred to um, UNHCR. Refugee education policy took on an organizational aspect simply because they were no people on the ground. From uh, 1998 to um, 2011, UNHCR did not have a single education officer working in refugee host countries. Um, more than recent uh, UNHCR policy um, emphasized that um, in, uh, integration of refugee learners within national systems. This situation shows that children with lethargy and internally displaced, displaced experience need no longer to be separated from local communities. In 2014, 50 of refugees um, had access to primary school. At the secondary level, 25 of the refugees had access to education compared with 62 globally for known refugees. And 5% of refugees have a secondary education compared to 38 of nationals. The children of um, preschool and secondary school age are often excluded from school integration program, usually when they are outside the scope of national law on the um, compulsory education. The most favorable treatment possible set forth in the article in Article 22 of Refugee Con Con Convention varies among host countries and refugees' right to education depends on the laws, policies, and practices implemented in each country's context. In addition, the impact of neoliberalism has meant that students from the relatively um, low socioeconomic background, such as children with refugee and IDP experience, are forcibly to attend school determined by their socioeconomic circumstances. And the choice and that choice affects their personal identity. At, 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 at the civil society level, social exclusion occurs through anti-immigrant and xenophobic um, attitude and behaviors toward the refugees. This takes the form of discrimination and harassment, ranging from verbal and um, emotional abuse to um, physical harassment. So, mm -hmm.
people who have been forced to immigration for survivor are grateful for their new lives, but also carry heartbreaking memories and feelings of loss for their previous ones. So when losing a person or being forcibly separated from a place and community, a person also loses who oneself is because a person does not exist independently, but rather within the context of a place and community, and thus will, will lose some element of their identity. Thus, rather than being um, privatized, the lament of loss reminds us the fundamental in, uh, interdependence and ethical responsibility of a community and of its many inseparable relationships. So this tendency clearly shows that Communities that have children with refugee and IDP experience need language and interventions that can truly embrace their pain and loss at the community level, as well as demand appropriate, appropriate political or economical support at the national level. Um, Hannah Arendt um, emphasized the right to belong to some community, not noting that this sense is much more fundamental than freedom and justice. For example, even if one, uh, even if they are sisters, the fact that some get visas and others do not is not only linked to the availability of a stable educational environments and suffer for our children to shape their lives the way they want to, but also it is a snapshot of the forced, forced separation and structural difficulties that some families face when it comes to their current and future prospects for survivor, where some are chosen and others are not. The children who have lost the existing bonds longing for new ones, which in and out itself exposes them to countless life-threatening situations of extreme violence and vulnerability. Uh, Mon uh, Montero argues that while many studi studies have highlighted the increased risk for children and adolescents with refugee background of developing mental health problems during the permanent resettlement process, few have considered their specific needs in, the, uh, in an educational context. Uh, Montero argues that appropriately embracing trauma narrative in the context of a classroom, a classroom is, uh, in, instruction can help all educators, especially those serving children and youth from refugee background better understand the process of recovering from trauma. Montero's research makes the con uh, contribution of Christian education remarkably clear. In order to take a trauma-informed approach in community work, uh, educators do not need to train the therapist. But they need the ability or desire to be respons responsive to others who are suffering and to offer support in humane way. The children who tell their stories themselves are able to engage in altruistic social movement and captured their experience by learning to use words such as discrimination, violence, disconnection, power. Here, lament as narrative for um, the exclusion, racism, and suffering of refugees can contribute to being heard and um, validated in an appropriate way in relation to the issue of refugee survivors. In this regard, using lament in Christian, Christian communities and education can counteract present vulnerability in a way that discerns the varied experience of refugee children because it listens to each child's needs in a mutual respectful way, rather than a way in which providers determine the needs and experience of their charges. Um, and um, Thomas Reynolds presents how to engage with justice and love in the sorrows of refugees. He criticized the one-sided and top-down approach that arises from generous donation when the host against the dichotomous relationship is patriarchal. How to share affluence by reaching out to the underprivileged and inviting other women, but only if the host maintains 
the initiated and only when the guest follows the host's way will the guest be included in that invitation. Depending on the host's initiation and their way, the guest here, refugees, will exist forever as a guest and remain subordinate to the power. This intentional or unintentional creation of power and subordination is not fully addressed by legal status. It is a matter of perception in every day, including physical and emotional issues. The discourse of hospitality leads us to think about the structures that prevent children's voice from being heard and limit their agency, making them one of the marginalized. Barbara Harbond argues that refugees are not a priori dependent and passive. Rather, humanitarian institutions and political structures have created and even demanded the dependence of the displaced persons on aid provider and donors. Like mentor and scholars interested in resilience, ethnographers view children as social actors who can mediate the negative experience of forced migration for themselves and others. So here we need to, to live together, not just to exist together, but live together. So we are not just facing someone's entire being who embraces God's declaration, you are all together beautiful, my love. There is no flaws in you, but also the God who made that declaration. We are facing the image of God that, that that they can never be despised, and they can never be marginalized, they can never be even ignored. There are differences between children and some with serious hostility due to their heart, but they remain our children bearing the image of God in us. The ethical understanding of embracement shows another perspective from the theological understanding, which is speaks of the image of God, acknowledging human imperfect Perfection itself empowers us to live out ethical demands. A perception that one's sense of responsibility that does not exclude unknown other is crucial because if your responsibility stems from an emotional connection to other, you may not care about well-being of your parents. Uh, we may care, care about uh, well-being of your parents, um, your friends, lovers, neighbors, so on. But be unmoved by the plight of a refugee who has been denied the right to enter your country. The power of embracing the self and, and, and beings around her lies in the environment itself, which honors, um, children's, ch which honors children for who they are. The practice of caring comes from relationship, not specific teachings from the community. And that Caring happens in many different ways, including invitating children into the conversation. But this conversation responds to different children in different ways. Practices care in a non-judgmental way and does not include expectation or judgment as a part of teacher's goal. So this pedagogical practice is not about establishing a particular form of pedagogy or a curriculum, but also about looking at education in epistemic and relational terms with the hope that children will be able to recognize their own value and live by advocating for the right and justice themselves and others, not only in their faith communities, but also in their schools or in many communities they will encounter. A goal of Christian education in the community of children with refugee and IDP experience needs to be a space where they can feel physically and emotionally safe, not to create a Christian religious elite, but to embrace the children as they are with their experience, thoughts, fears, wounds, both positive and negative. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Eliana. And uh, I invite anybody who wants to, again, to put 
uh, questions into the chat or to uh, raise raise hands or to simply uh, ask a question. I did uh, I did see a couple of of uh, those questions in the chat for or questions and or comments for Ezra's paper. We will return to those in a bit. I've saved those uh, those chats to put back in uh, later. Uh, to, to get us started in this portion of question and answer, um, one question that I have uh, for you, Eliana, uh, is uh, as far as uh, as far as specific practices that you may have in mind. Uh, while while I think we many of us, if not all of us, have an idea of what lament could look like uh, with with children and. Uh, and adolescents of uh, who have refugee or IDP experiences, what, from your perspective, what might a lament practice look like uh, that's done either in a classroom setting or in a congregational setting? Um, thank you for the question, Peter. Um, it is quite important because um, people, um, use of the lament is just crying or just express express their just grief. But here, lament is um, it's about acknowledging each other's vulnerability. As I mentioned in my paper, that I may not be able to help them completely, and that I that I may fail to listen to their lives, just just independently accept the vulnerabilities. That can be the start point. And that's um, in, um, that's why grief practice need to um, start by um, giving children their initiative. Um, and it is, um, it, is, it is through children's gradual um, articulation of their experience and, and the experience of their stories being told to the community or any setting, congregation, congregational setting or a classroom setting, that they discover their own language. It's not quite just language. It can be an action or express their um, kind of, can be dance or painting or something useful, many tools. So, and that kind of language to express their grief and experience. But never, the important thing is never set any goals for them just open mind to them and open space can speak. Let them exercise their own agency. Right. Others with questions or comments to make on Eliana's presentation. Well, if not, then I have another question. Um, what might there be, uh, or what ways, right, rather, might there be to mitigate language barriers in a lament or storytelling session, assuming that those who are uh, uh, children or uh, youth with uh, with these these refugee or IDP experiences, assuming they don't have they their first language is not the first language of the host place, um, what might there be to mitigate those language barriers beyond parents or other adults simply translating for, for children? Um, thank you for the question too. Um, as I mentioned before, I don't believe that the just language, like vocal language is the only way to express children's feeling or, or their experience. In many refugee camps, um, children are cared for and communicated with through drawings and other tools. So I think different, um, maybe counseling techniques um, can help us, but I think what is needed most is a heartfelt attitude towards children and a sincere willingness to listen as sometimes a warm hug or a, just a glance can be a conversation. Thank you. Paulos, you have a question? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I will uh, give two questions for the first Eliana and the, uh, and the second for, for Esa. Uh, from Eliana, uh, I'm so glad that you present to us about hospitality and living together with our children. When, uh, based on my experience, uh, when I meet to children, hospitality can be like easy, but it's like, uh, but it's look like difficult because uh, we don't understand what they, uh, they are feeling and they are thinking, especially for early, early childhood. So uh, to understand them, I always ask to uh, their parents uh, what their habits in their home. And their parents tell many kinds of their, uh, this experience so it can help me as a teacher uh, can understand what are the children's feeling. But uh, I think it's not easy because uh, children uh, always, uh, especially early childhood, cannot express well. So uh, I think that when we read your paper, Hospitality and Living Together, uh, I think that we must make a correlation or bridging, uh, building bridge with parents or uh, their society and extra. Maybe this is uh, my argument or my opinion when I read your paper and maybe you can uh, give a comment about it. Uh, and and then a uh, comment and question for answer. I'm so glad when you use about uh, belonging and spiritual formation of migrant youth. Uh, I think that when I read your paper, I give uh, I have uh, idea. Maybe you can uh, use multicultural or or. Um, multicultural education or multicultural dialogue. So maybe it can solve about this problem as a migrant youth. I don't know how far or how it can be solved about this, pro uh, this problem. So we maybe we can try it. And, and it's not easy because uh, there are, uh, we are understand about uh, first generation, second generation until uh, fourth generation maybe. Thank you. So, uh, yes, Eliana. Yeah, thank you for um, the question. Um, yeah, you are right. Um, in recounting the experience of the children in particular, despite the fact that the reality of the experience may be conveyed differently in different memories even, the country, um, the communities listening to the stories of suffering children's, um, so, some kind of some somewhat distorted stories in their memories, is not merely the matter of expanding perspective, nor um, is it an act of blaming any particular group or individual, but of bearing witness, witness and confessing and confront the truth their truth, I mean the individual truth, not the whole truth. So it is meaningful. And, and as you said, the younger children, and the most difficult it is for them to ex explain the complexity of their experience through this, this kind of narratives. However, however, the one way to support children's um, autonomy is to support their perspective on their own memory. In this respect, um, children's narrative reconstruction of their past may or may, be, may not be relevant to the issues of justice and welfare and may not focus on morally relevant events, but at least they may reveal their emotion concept, emotional concept. So it is also important. And, Thank you. And Ezra, if you would like to comment on um, on Pavlos's question to you, uh, now you you may, if, if you like. Uh, yeah, intercultural communication, like multicultural communication, I think that is really important. Um, 
been able to do that, I think, uh, not only just the first generation, but also the second generation, um, they have to understand each other first and listen to their stories. Um, and if we could do that, I think that could be a good starter for um, the church to become uh, more understanding to each other and solve these generational gaps. And I think that's and that's one of the reasons why I argue that we have to see youth as agents first. So we just don't dismiss whatever they're saying or whatever they're doing is just considered as youth being youth, who has just a couple of privileges and some perks. And it goes the other way with youth too. Um, they can't just dismiss adult generation as just boomers and uh, whatever they say, it's not really uh, pertaining to them, but um, under like trying to be really open and understanding each other, being respectful and being open um, is really important. And I, I'm really glad that you brought that up as one of the ways to, um, yeah, lessen the gap between to the, the, the generations. Thank you. I'm also wondering, like, have you seen any of um, these like multicultural or intercultural conversations um, happening in a positive way in, in your context? If I'm allowed to ask questions too. <laughs> yes, we have entered the period where uh, it's, a, it's a combined Q and A. Okay, uh, I will answer your, uh, maybe I will share about my, uh, my context. I, I'm from Indonesia. And when we, um, when we learn or and practice about multicultural or intercultural context, especially for the Indonesia is Indonesia have many kind of ethnic group. So uh, there are uh, not, uh, there are many kind of ethnic group and Multi race, so we can work together, and we understand and tolerate and uh, work together in some works or maybe some project or some job. I know uh, it is not easy because when you maybe when you read some news from Indonesia, there are many kind of conflict, religious conflict, cultural conflict, and etc. And we are struggling about it. So uh, once up the the solution from religious uh, religious ministry from uh, my governor is to promote uh, religion uh, moderation because from religion moderation this is uh, be, uh, using multicultural basis especially from theology so psychology communication sociology anthropology and it it can make how to uh, many kind of uh, ethnic group can work together, many kind of religion can work together and embrace and increase toleration, uh, openness to others. It is not easy, but we, we still struggling until now. Thank you. I, I had a question in the in the chat box. This is Remigius. I don't know if you noticed. Um, I am interested in, in this theology of lament and hospitality and living together. And I'm wondering um, how valuable it is uh, just to acknowledge the grief of the individual, because I think lament is almost always about some grief, some loss, right? Acknowledging that loss and grief, is it ever valuable when you cannot, there is no follow up, you can't mitigate the cause of the loss. You, you don't have resources to attenuate the pain or suffering of the individual lamenting. So uh, this question will be for the last speaker, Ariana, I believe that, that's your name. Oh, it, I, I hope I didn't mix it up. 
Thank you. Thank you for um, your questions, ranges. Um, so this individual element is not, um, I think it's not ended that there's the individuals because like through the practice of lament as a narrative, children are able to deal with their own inner guilt and anger and develop their capacity as moral agents to prepare for other um, instances of violence or, or tragedy and to connect with the suffering of others. The children are sharing their possibilities as agents in a community rather than understanding themselves merely as victims of various violence, incapable of taking care of themselves. So local faith community or education can address the collective sensitivity of the community to our children, deep hearts and grief in a way that respects their loss of bonds and levels and affirms their experience of suffering from violence. So each kind of collective um, sensitivity, um, in other words, like hypersensitive, hypersense, have, having hypersensitive to um, suffering from violence. So it, it is acknowledging its big, big steps, I think. Thank you very much. That was very powerful. I wanted that. I wanted that point to be, uh, to come from you because um, working in the hospital as a chaplain, that's that listening to to people's pain and suffering can be very difficult. And uh, most of us, I, I see you quoted Neil Noddings. Most of us are not prepared to listen because it is tough. And it is at the end of the listening that the response or the resolution comes again from the patient whom I consider to be the expert in his or her own suffering. Uh, it's not about um, my uh, uh, standing on a pedestal and, and, and telling him or her what to do or what not to do or what to say or not what to say, but offering a space for the expression of pretty powerful, people are powerful. They, uh, uh, they, they seek and the hurting uh, of uh, geniuses, I call them experts. And we are better off listening to them and we get wiser by so doing. And uh, probably I could say in a, in a most rewarding way, um, find out maybe somewhere or at the instance that this individual is capable of addressing the very issues that led him or her to the hospital. You know, thank you very much. Appreciate your response. Thank you. <laughs> and as you could see from uh, from my. Uh, accidentally sent to everyone message. Uh, Ezra unfortunately needs to uh, leave in order to attend the networking coordinator meeting. Uh, I know that, uh, that Norma and Chuck had, um, had uh, Norma had a question and Chuck had a comment. I'm sorry that, that was, we weren't able to uh, get to those, but um, I, do, I did save the, uh, your question, Norma, and your comment, Chuck, even apart from the from the chat, so hopefully Eliana can get back to you on that. Um, any other questions for? Uh, sorry, I mean Ezra can get back to you on that. Any other questions for Eliana? I was looking at her uh, as I was saying that. That's why I, I uh, mixed up names there. As mentioned in uh, in the chat earlier, this Zoom room is open for the next. Well, I don't know exactly how how long it is, but we are we can be open past the scheduled um, ending time of fifteen past the hour. So if you would like to to hang out, um, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, if those are of you who are on 
uh, on South Korean time want to hang out a little bit more uh, here, I can make one of you the host. And by all means, you are uh, welcome to uh, to chat there. Um, one thing I, I did want to, to mention, uh, since we are still uh, still in this uh, this question and answer space. One thing I did want to mention, Eliana, is, is I really appreciated what you had to say, um, both in the paper and the, present, and the presentation, about um, those of us who are in, um, in educational roles, uh, at the same time, having, if, if you will, a, uh, a pastoral care role and taking on uh, many of those, those aspects of, of care, because I, I appreciate that personally, because um, in my own life, I've found myself in uh, in settings where I needed needed to be pastoral, where I needed to uh, to to practice care. And while on the one hand, kind of the uh, the credential conscious side of me thinks, you know, that's I'm not licensed to do that, and not not talking about um, clinical pastor clinical um, kinds of things, but like licensed in in the way that, as an Old Testament professor of mine said, he was teaching the New Testament without a license at one time. Anyway, um, at, at the same at the same time, I, I thought this is something that needs to be part of the educator or even the preacher or the other practical theologians, um, not just toolkit, but something that they they have as part of their own practice of uh, in in their field. That's more of a more of a comment necessarily than than a question. So thank you for bringing that up. Prior to the hour. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine though. I mean, there's nothing happening in the Zoom room now, so it's happy if people want to hang out. I was just smiling because the conversation is clearly so compelling. People are staying. <laughs> okay, okay. I apologize. That was that was my uh, my thing then because I could not uh, I could not do time apparently. <laughs> And I appreciate Peter and, and Mary to support this session. Thank you so much for your dedication. <laughs> 15 minutes prior to the hour. How, how did I get? That's, <laughs> don't sorry, that's, don't that's worry about it, Peter. Thing. If If it had been a problem, I would have stopped. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. I think this topic is so important, though, and I think both Eliana and Esther's papers are so important. And I think I, I want to just note to everybody who's still here that we will we have recorded this and we will put it up and it might be something to share with your classes or or your churches, your you know, other kinds of settings, because I think some of what is shared here um, isn't as easily accessible for people in other places. So. Agreed. Well, Mary, thank okay. you again for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Did somebody have a comment? Mary, thank you again for, uh, for facilitating the tech side of this. Eliana, thank you again for presenting. And for those of you who are still here, uh, Remigius, Norma, Eileen, and Pablos, thank you for, um, for being a part of this session.